please open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 18. We're going to be looking at chapter 18, verses 1 to 11. And you can follow along as I read it. John 18. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers, some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have not lost one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put away your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? The concept of glory literally means brightness or splendor or radiance. If you say something is glorious in its nature, you are referring to the fact that it has splendor. And to receive glory, a person is one who stands out brightly above the rest. And hence, we often see the idea of glory being applied to heroes and to the victors. You hear about glory on the battlefield from the army that wins. You hear and or observe glory of victory at an athletic event. And you even might ascribe glory to someone who is uniquely influential to other people. But one of the striking things about Jesus is that as he goes to the cross and as we look at John 13 through the end and see that one of the regular themes is glory, we see that in Jesus, his glory is not displayed in conquering power or immediate victory. In fact, his glory is shown in just the opposite. His glory is shown in surrender. The glory of Jesus is revealed as he lays down his life for us. And here in the Gospel of John, we look in chapter 18 and we see the story of his betrayal and his arrest. And what is highlighted in these short 11 verses are the moments that point to his glory. The setting, of course, is that Jesus is taking his disciples to a garden and there's wonderful symbolism and meaning found in the nature of him being in the garden. The Garden of Gethsemane, as it's referred to in other Gospels, is on the Mount of Olives and it's most likely a walled-in private olive grove that a wealthy businessman allowed Jesus and his disciples to access for their personal use. Verse 2 tells us that they'd been there before and Judas knew the place. 
The setting is quiet. It's intimate. It's within the city gate so they could observe the Passover. And it is the perfect place for him to spend his final hours with his disciples and to commune with his Father in heaven in prayer. It's fitting that in these final hours before the death of Jesus, he's in a garden. And one scholar points to the fact that in some ways, the fact that he's in a garden here near the end recalls to our memory the fact that the story of God in the human history began in a garden. And how in the Garden of Eden, that first garden, Adam and Eve, our human parents, fell into sin and set humanity on a trajectory and a need for redemption. And here at the end of the life of Jesus, he's in a garden again, preparing to give the very redemption that is needed. And so look at the contrast with me. The first Adam began life in a garden. Christ, the second Adam, as he's often referred to, the perfect man, the second Adam, came to the end of his life in a garden. In Eden, Adam sinned. In Gethsemane, the Savior overcame sin. In Eden, Adam fell. In Gethsemane, Jesus conquered. In Eden, Adam hid himself. And in Gethsemane, the Lord boldly presented himself. In Eden, the sword was drawn, and in Gethsemane, the sword was sheathed. The Garden of Eden was the place of life that would lead to death. And the Garden of Gethsemane was the place of death that would lead to life. And so verse 3 says that a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. And the picture is starting to become vivid. It's hard to know how many soldiers arrived on scene. A typical Roman detachment was about 1,000 soldiers in it a full auxiliary cohort. The Greek used here seems to indicate that this was called a maniple, which was usually about 200 men. We don't know if all 200 men uh, were present or if it was just a segment of them, but the picture is a formidable force of Romans along with some Jewish temple officials. And you can see what's happening, right? Try to put yourself in the place. Try to feel it for a moment. The garden was quiet. The prayers of the Lord to his Father were present. The tension in the street was palpable as rumors swirled about Jesus. Some hated him. Others were curious about him and some loved him. Some people had seen his miraculous power and others had heard his teaching and they called it blasphemous in its nature. A small detachment of soldiers just wouldn't do. What if his arrest incited a riot in the people of Jerusalem? The city was swollen with visitors. What if he really was so powerful that he could overcome 10 or 20 or 30 men? We better send a larger group. A hundred? 150, 200 soldiers versus 12, that should do it. There's no way that he could overtake us then. Little did they know that glory on that night was not going to be displayed in victory and force, but that glory on that night would be displayed in the surrender that would happen before the fight. The glory of Jesus is revealed as he lays down his life willingly for us. Judas leads the detachment of soldiers to the garden. He'd been there before. He knew where to find Jesus' disciples. 
And Jesus knew that Judas was the one who was his betrayer. You might remember a few chapters back in chapter 13, he's reclining at the table with them. At the Last Supper, he serves them by washing their feet as an example that they should serve each other. They're going from place to place. And in the middle of that, he looks right at Judas and he says, what you do, do quickly. Judas rises from the table and he scurries into the night to set the plan in motion. But of course, Jesus knew that Judas would betray him all along. Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him before Judas knew Judas was going to betray him. A couple years earlier, all the way back in John chapter 6, you see in verse 64 that Jesus knew from the beginning those who it was that did not believe and who it was that would betray him. In John chapter 6 verse 70, Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. And in John 13, he knew who was to betray him. And that's why he said, not all of you are clean. And it's amazing to think about, isn't it? That Jesus kept Judas around for all that time. I mean, I'm a pretty high loyalty person. And if I know someone's going to betray me, I don't want to keep you around for a couple of minutes. And he kept him around for two, three years Why would he do that? The only reason could be that Jesus knew that glory would be displayed in the events that were to come. And so the detachment of of soldiers come. Judas is off to the side, ready to point out Jesus. And Jesus steps forward in verse 4, and he says, Whom do you seek? Who are you looking for? (laughs) He knows the answer. But it's interesting to pause and think about it for a minute, isn't it? That's the question that so many people ask as they go through life. Who are you looking for? What are you looking for? Whom do you seek? Whether it's people who are looking for God or looking for pleasure or looking for meaning in life or looking for someone to blame for your problems. Who are you looking for? The words pierce through history. The garden is now crowded. Twelve versus 200. And Jesus takes control. Judas doesn't have to point him out because Jesus is going to make himself known. Whom do you seek? He asks and they reply confidently. 200 versus 12 confidently. Jesus of Nazareth, I am he, is the reply. And immediately, the detachment of soldiers fall onto their backs. Maybe, maybe somebody stepped on the foot of the guy next to him and 200 people packed in a small space and it was the domino effect and they all kind of down they go. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe it was the fact that they were just surprised. They were, they were ready for a fight. Torches and weapons and everything was drawn. And, and well, I'm, I'm shocked. He just surrendered. I'll fall over now. Or most likely, Jesus revealed a glimpse of his glory to them in his surrender. I am he, he said. Throughout Jesus' entire life, he'd been showing people through his words and his miracles that he is God. He's not some sort of half God. He's not some sort of demigod. He's united with God the Father. He is of the same essence with his Father, but a different personhood. He was sent from the Father, and his words are the words of the Father, and his deeds are the deeds of the Father. And now again he shows them that his name is even the name of the Father. The Hebrew name for God, Yahweh, means I am. I am who I am, God says in the Old Testament. I am the self-existent one. I am self-determining. I am sovereign. 
No one influences me. I influence everyone and everything around me. My ways are perfect. My statues are firm. I never change. I am who I am. I am God. And so when Jesus looks at the soldiers and literally says, Ego a me, I am, they all fall to the ground backwards. And it would seem as if in that moment, the highlight of this very short story, that he gives them just a taste, just a glimpse of who they are really dealing with here. He gives them a taste of glory. It's interesting in the Bible, every person who's pursuing God and comes in contact with him in some way, miraculous way, we call that a divine theophany, they all fall on their face in humble submission and worship to him. They're so overtaken by his presence that the only thing that they could possibly do in response is to fall on their face. Here, we see that all of these people who are not in humble submission to God, but who are opposed to God, fall on their backs in momentary defeat at his power and his glory. And it makes sense. How do you arrest someone who is self-determining in their nature, truly self-determining? How do you arrest someone who's completely sovereign? To be sovereign means that you influence everything around you. You, No one can dictate what you do. How do you arrest someone like that? You don't. And this begs the question, who is arresting whom in the Garden of Gethsemane? They came to subdue Jesus They ended up on their backs. (laughs) Who is arresting whom? It's amazing to think that you can be around the glorious one without recognizing it until he shows you. Paul Tripp writes of a time when he took his youngest son to one of the National Art Galleries in Washington, D.C., And he says that as we made our approach, I was so excited about what we were going to see. He was decidedly unexcited. But I just knew that once we got inside, that he would have his mind blown and he would thank me for everything that I had done for him on that day. And as it turned out, his mind wasn't blown. It wasn't even activated. I saw things of such stunning beauty that it brought me to the edge of tears. He yawned and moaned and complained his way through gallery after gallery. With every new gallery, I was enthralled. But each time we walked into a new art space, he begged me to leave. He was surrounded by glory, but saw none of it. He stood in the middle of wonders, but was bored out of his mind. His eyes worked well, but his heart was stone blind. He saw everything, but he saw nothing. Friends, that is the picture of someone who brushes up against the Lord Jesus, but doesn't extend to him in faith. Sure, you can know about him, You can see what feels like everything, but is actually nothing. And it's interesting in this account that as Jesus arrests them with his glory, he turns and he allows them to arrest him for his glory. As Jesus arrests them with his glory, he then turns and he allows them to arrest him for his glory. You can see it. A couple hundred clunky soldiers regaining their feet. He asks them again, almost comically, who are you seeking? They answer Jesus of Nazareth again. He says, I told you I am he. 
So if you seek me, then let these men go. There's little doubt that the detachment was going to arrest all of them. And Jesus surrenders himself and he saves his disciples in the process. Just the previous chapter in John 17, the high priestly prayer, he says, he prays to the Father that none that the Father has given him have been lost. And now indeed, none of them are lost. And this exchange, the sacrifice, surrender of Jesus for the safety of his followers, is of course not just a physical exchange for the moment. It's the foreshadowing of what is to come in the hours ahead. It's the symbol of the spiritual reality that we all experience if we have faith in the Lord. Glory is here. The glory for Jesus in sacrificing himself and the safety for his followers who believe in him. The glory of Jesus is revealed as he willingly lays down his life for us. There is a brief attempt to hijack that glory, at least on that night. We see as the story goes on, verse 10, that Peter draws his sword, most likely a dagger. With one swipe, he cuts off the ear of the servant Malchus. Glory had just been revealed. 200 men had just been put on their backs. And now here comes Peter ready for war. I mean, what did he think he was going to do? Really? And though his loyalty is certainly admirable, his actions are foolish. Because he was not going to hijack, he was not going to be able to hijack the mission of Jesus. He would not be able to deny Jesus the cup of suffering that his father had arranged for him. And he would not rob the glory that Jesus would receive in surrender. The glory of Jesus is revealed as he lays down his life for us. And until you start to see or grasp that type of glory, then you will subtly miss place or under-evaluate the things that Jesus does for you. I thought a lot about how it is you arrest someone who is sovereign. How is it that you arrest the self-determining Son of God? And as we close this morning, I want to do something a little bit different. I want to tell you a little longer story, which I think illustrates the point well. There was a certain professor of religion named Dr. Christensen, who was a studious man, taught in a small college in the western United States. Dr. Christensen taught the required survey course in Christianity that this particular institution made every student take. One year, Dr. Christensen had a special student named Steve. Steve was only a freshman, but he was studying with the view of going on to seminary, and he felt called by God to go into Christian ministry. Steve was also a very popular young man, well-liked by his peers, and he was an imposing physical specimen. He was now the starting center of the school football team, and he was the best student in the professor's class. And so one day, Dr. Christensen asked Steve if he could stay after class and if he could talk to him. And as they started talking, he said, hey, Steve, how many push-ups can you do? Steve said, I do 200 push-ups every night. 200? It's pretty good, the professor said. Do you think that you could do 300? Steve said, well, I don't know. I've never tried 300. He said, do you think you could do 300? I can try, Steve said. Could, I, I need you to do 300 push-ups in sets of 10. I have a class experiment in mind, but to be able to do it, you need to be able to do 300 in sets of 10. I need you to tell me that you can do it if this is going to work. And Steve paused for a moment and he said, well, I think, yeah, I should be able to do it. Great, said the professor. I need you to do it on this Friday. Let me explain what I have in mind. Friday morning came and Steve sat up near the front of the class at his desk. And when class started, the professor pulled out a large box of large donuts. Not small donuts, large donuts. 
And everyone was pretty excited about it because it was Friday, it was the weekend, it was the last day of class. They were going to get the weekend started early by having a little party in Dr. Christensen's class that morning. And so Dr. Christensen went to the, to the girl in the first row and he asked her, Cynthia, would you like a donut? Well, yes, Cynthia replied. And at that, the professor turned over to Steve and he said, Steve, would you please do 10 push-ups so Cynthia can have a donut? Sure thing. Steve dropped to the ground, did a quick 10, and returned to his desk. Dr. Christensen took the donut and put it on Cynthia's desk. And then he went to the next person who was named Joe, and he said, Joe, would you like a donut? And Joe said, yeah, I'd like a donut. And so Dr. Christensen turned to Steve again and said, Steve, would you do 10 push-ups so that Joe can have a donut? No problem. Steve did 10 push-ups, Joe got a donut. And so it went for every person down the first aisle. Steve did 10 push-ups for every single one of them so they could receive their donut. Walking to the second aisle, Dr. Christensen came to a student named Scott. Scott was on the basketball team. He was in as good a condition physically as Steve was. And he was also a handsome young man that never lacked female companionship. And so when the professor asked, Scott, would you like a donut? Scott's reply was, well, can I do my own push-ups? And the professor replied, nope, Steve has to do them. And Scott responded, well, then I don't want one. Dr. Christensen shrugged and he turned to Steve and said, Steve, would you do 10 push-ups so that Scott can have a donut that he doesn't want? <laughs> yes. In perfect obedience, Steve started to do the 10 push-ups. Scott protested, hey, I said I didn't want one. To which Dr. Christensen said, look, this is my classroom, it's my class, it's my desk, and they're my donuts. If you don't want the donut, that's fine, just leave it on the desk. And he went to the next student. By this time, Steve was starting to slow down a little bit more. He had stayed on the floor between sets instead of returning to his desk because it was just too much work to keep getting up and down. And there was a little bit of perspiration that was starting to gather over his brow. Dr. Christensen started down the third row, and the students were beginning to get a little angry. And as the professor asked Jenny, Jenny, do you want a donut? Sternly, she replied, no. Then the professor asked Steve, Steve, would you like to do 10 more push-ups so Jenny can have a donut that she doesn't want? Steve did 10, Jenny got the donut. By now, there's a growing sense of uneasiness in the classroom. The students were beginning to say no, and there were a lot of uneaten donuts on the desks. Steve also had to really put forward a lot of extra effort at this point, and there was a pool of sweat that was beginning to gather on the floor beneath where he was doing the push-ups. Dr. Christensen asked Robert, who was the student in the class, who was the most vocal unbeliever in the Lord, to watch Steve and to make sure that Steve actually did 10 push-ups for every single set because the professor himself could no longer bear to watch his student as he struggled through. So Robert went down right next to where Steve was and he counted the set after set to watch Steve closely. Dr. Christensen was now at the fourth row and during the class, however, some students hearing kind of what was going on from the hallway started to make their way into the room and they'd sit on those radiators along the sides of the walls. And as the professor was looking around the room, he did a quick count and realized that now the number had gone up to 34 students. Starting to get a little worried for Steve if he could make it. He went to the next person and then the next and then the next and near the end of the row, Steve was really having a rough time. He was taking a lot more time to complete each set. A few moments later, Jason, who was a recent transfer student, came to the room and was about to come in and he stood at the threshold of the door and the whole class said, no, don't come in. Steve picked up his head and said, no, let him come in. And the professor looked at him and said, you realize if Jason comes in, then you're gonna have to do 10 push-ups for him, right? And Steve said, give him a donut. And he did. Jason didn't know what was going on. He was new to the room and the professor said, would you like a donut? And he said, I'd love a donut, sure thing. He took his donut and Steve did the 10 push-ups. Dr. Christensen finished the fourth row and then started on those visitors who were seated on the heaters. Steve's arms, arms were shaking now 
with every single push-up, and the struggle to lift himself against the force of gravity was intense. By this time, there was sweat profusely dripping off his face. There was no sound in the room except for heavy breathing, and there were no dry eyes in the room either. The very last two students, two popular girls, both cheerleaders, were sitting there, and Dr. Christensen went to Linda, the second to the last, and he said, Linda, do you want a donut? And very sadly, she said, no, thank you. And the professor quietly asked Steve, would you do 10 push-ups so that Linda can have a donut that she doesn't want? And grunting with effort, he did the push-ups very slowly. And as the professor came to the last girl named Susan, he said, Susan, do you want a donut? And with tears flowing down her face, she began to cry. She said, why can't I help him? And the professor explained with tears in his own eyes, Steve has to do this one alone. I've given this task to him. And he is in charge of seeing it through to its completion. He's in charge of seeing that everyone has the opportunity for a donut, whether they want it or not. He's the only student in the class all semester who has the perfect grade. Everyone else has failed a test or skipped a class or handed an imperfect work in some way. But Steve told me that in football practice, when they make mistakes, when a player messes up, he must do push-ups. And so I told Steve that none of you could come to my party unless he paid the price for you by doing push-ups. He and I made a deal for your sake. Steve, would you do 10 push-ups so that Susan can have a donut? And as Steve very slowly finished the last push-up, understanding that he had accomplished all that was required of him, having done 350 push-ups, his arms buckled beneath him and he fell to the floor. Dr. Christensen turned to the room and he said, and so it was that our Savior Jesus on the cross pled with his Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. With the understanding that he had done everything required of him, he yielded up his life And like some in this room, many of us take the gift and many of us leave it uneaten. Two students helped Steve off the ground, helped him to his chair. Physically exhausted but wearing a thin smile on his face, the professor looked at him and said, well done, good and faithful servant. And turning back to the class, he said, my wish is that you might understand and fully comprehend all of the riches and grace and mercy that have been given to you through the willful surrender and sacrifice of Jesus. God spared not only his only begotten son, but he gave him up that all of us, the whole church, now and forevermore would experience him. Whether or not you choose to accept him is up to you, but the price has been paid. Wouldn't it be foolish then to leave the gift sitting on the desk? How could Jesus, the fully sovereign God of the universe, be arrested? He couldn't. The only way is that if he would surrender willingly. And this is where his glory is. It began on the days marching to Easter in the garden. So, will you trust him? Will you take the gift that he gives? Will you recognize glory where it's displayed? The glory of Jesus is 
revealed as he lays down his life for us. And that's why he says in John chapter 10, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the loving sacrifice and surrender of Jesus. We thank you that glory is displayed in such ways and that his ultimate worth and value are worthy of our deepest pursuits. They're worthy of our trust and it's worthy even of our lives. And so we pray today, Father, help us to faithfully follow him as he gives life to us. And it's in his mighty name that we pray. Amen.